Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, please call the roll. Ruth Griffey, Douglas Knight, Amanda Mil Lee Milner. Here. Matthew Nelson, David Reinecker, Here. Richard Sterner. Here. Corey Trosel. Here. Michael Wool. Here. Jennifer Zerfing here. Lisa Conrad. Here. John Defoe. Jennifer Ely. Here. Mark Fleming. Here. John Fox. Here. Mark Erb. Shane Hotchkiss. Here. Wade Hunt. Here. Shannon Myers. Here. Justin Peart. Here. Ethan Sense. Here. Nope, they're, they're not on. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, approval of minutes, none. Financial reports, none. Hearing of scheduled delegations or individuals, none. Any public comment? At this time, I see none. Okay. Correspondence, none. Reported and related actions, none. Old business, none. New business, uh, we have an instructional aid uh, approval. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? This is a roll call vote. All those members in attendance will be recorded as voting in favor of the motion unless I hear nay or abstain. Motion carries. In other business, item A, uh, winter sports. Yes, hi. Uh, this is Dr. Hotchkiss. Um, we have two uh, discussion items today, winter sports, and I'll be providing uh, an update to the board um, based on the request made at the last meeting as far as COVID cases by zip code. But I've asked Mr. Orwig um, to attend today so he can give you an update on the return to competition guidelines uh, that um, are in, in place for the winter sports. Um, and then certainly uh, uh, there's a few questions based on the um, guidelines and mandates that were pushed out yesterday. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Orwig, who will kind of walk you through um, uh, the latest and greatest regarding winter sports. So Mr. Orwig. My apologies. So we begin the winter season, uh, or nearly there on Friday. Uh, we begin by asking our student athletes, coaches and parents to sign a participation waiver for communicable diseases. Uh, that was produced by our solicitor and uh, it's something that was signed in, for the fall season as well. Um, last week, the PIAA uh, put out a, a document, the return to competition, which is guidelines and recommendations, uh, no mandates for the winter season, and how you should handle that. There were general considerations, considerations for officials, and considerations, of course, that, that affect us in basketball, wrestling, and cheerleading. The YAIAA also uh, held a meeting last Wednesday. In that meeting, it was determined that schools could determine whether they wanted to play a full or a partial schedule. It would be home spectators only, no visiting spectators, and schools would comply with all PIAA return to play recommendations. The league itself would not no longer be holding any postseason events. So uh, traditionally, the York Adams League um, has a pretty major basketball tournament at the end of the season. 
Uh, that is has been determined to be canceled at this point. So after receiving uh, the information from both the league and the PIAA, we held our traditional, normal winter head coaches meeting. It is a get you ready. These are all the things that we need to accomplish to be prepared and ready to go for the season. Um, and that was with our basket head, head coaches and head junior high coaches in boys and girls basketball, wrestling, cheerleading, and our athletic trainer. So as a massive group, we went through our normal procedures. And at that point, we all determined, as we did in the fall, that it was important for me as the athletic director to meet with them then individually to go over the guidelines and the recommendations that were important to their sport because they are somewhat different. So those meetings were conducted um, individually. Uh, I will tell you they all took about two hours to complete because what we did during that time period is talk about how we were going to conduct practices. We talked about how we were going to conduct home games. And we talked about the procedures that we would have to follow in order to go on the road. I don't know how specific you want me to get into each, the basketball, the wrestling, and the cheerleading. Uh, in terms of the specific guidelines, they are outlined obviously in the PIAA piece, but I would certainly entertain any questions or go into greater detail if you would like. Yeah, Ms. This is Rich Turner. Mr. Orwig, it's my understanding that I, um, some schools that we might play, like Boiling Springs right now, is on full remote. I'm assuming, I, I don't know if we play anybody like that at this point. Or uh, there are some schools that when they go into substantial, like Adams County is right now, that aren't playing games. How, how much does that affect our sports schedule? Well, today was kind of a crazy day, Mr. Sterner, to be honest with you. Um, we've had events canceled because of, for example, in basketball, uh, we were one of three schools that were going to be in a basketball scrimmage. They made a determination at that district, it was an away event for us, that they were only going to entertain two schools. So we were the we were we were the out. Um, so you you go out and you try to find something for your kids. And in this case, I was fortunate enough to find something. Uh, we had a tip off tournament canceled today uh, that we were going to participate in. Uh, I got feelers out to try to replace that at this point in time. So when you say this, it, it's an ongoing process at, at this point where schedules today may not reflect schedules by next week. Um, our wrestling uh, situation, to elaborate a little bit more, um, Cumberland Valley uh, canceled their individual tournament. Carlisle canceled their individual tournament. Carlisle's going on for like 100 years or something like that. Um, what we've done in place of those is we've scheduled two individual dual meets one with Dover and one with the Southwestern. So we are not going to reach our competition max in that particular sport. And I would guess we won't reach our max as things have gone today in anything. So it's, it's very fluid, more so today than it was earlier this week. Mr. Orwig, this is Amanda Lee Milner. I was just curious about what what coordination is done with the limited facilities and the 
um, COVID restrictions for the recreational leagues for the kids that are, um, what is it, ki kindergarten through six that play in the different gyms and have wrestling practice. Are those programs still going to be permitted to be in the school or will those uh, programs be curtailed in order to give the space needed for the varsity and junior varsity um, teams? Them being in the facility in the past has never influenced the JV, the varsity or the junior high programs. We've worked, we worked in concert with one another. So we're not taking up any more, more or less time, actually less time uh, at all of our, uh, with all of our programs. My understanding is that we were not bringing people in from the outside uh, so that we had a chance to clean. So and, if you recall uh, earlier this summer, we had as part of our health and safety plan, we made the determination as a, a school district that we would not allow any outside entities into schools. Um, and so we have not done that for people using this facility or any of the other facilities, even through the fall, where some of our youth leagues did use those fields. We have not permitted uh, the use of any of our facilities um, by outside organizations. We did open up the track so that people could walk, you know, limited. But as far as allowing people for a sustained period of time to have those, we just have not. Just because of the impact um, and our inability to kind of control everything that we can control from a cleanliness and protocols and all of those type of things. So we've made uh, that stance and, and um, have not uh, and would not be making any recommendation to change that at this point, at least um, from a use standpoint. And I would add that uh, we're not we're the same as everybody else in this area. Uh, those youth programs, to my knowledge, at this point in time, have either find, found alternative sites or have been canceled or have found alternative programs. Um, the Hanover YMCA I know is hosting some form of a basketball league for K through six, but I don't have a great description of that. The only thing that I'll add yesterday, um, I was, last evening, I got a copy of the recent mandates by um, the state for travel and from the Department of Health for uh, face coverings. Like most things, we're still trying to get some clarification on the order. The order for face coverings is definitely more restrictive. Um, you all have seen that. And so um, I'm holding off on pushing anything out to the staff, to the community until we can get a few questions answered, for instance. Previous orders that have gone out, um, once the global uh, mandate is going out, they've always done something specific for schools, for instance. And the, uh, you know, you must wear a mask if you're not six feet away from somebody. Now, if you're just indoors. However, there's always been an exception. If you're, you know, if you're an athlete, you know, for the volleyball that we're playing while they were competing, they did not have to. Yesterday's order specifically said activities and gyms inside you must. And so it's a definite change. And we're just trying to get some clarification to uh, understand, to make sure, does that apply to every activity within a school now? Because previously they differentiated. And so if it does to everything, that would impact uh, winter sports. That means our basketball players would have masks on when they're playing basketball. Wrestlers would have those on. Officials will have those on. And so we're, we're waiting to get some clarification um, on whether that does or does not apply, and then we'll be pushing something out. And I know that that's been a conversation that I know athletic directors have had. And we, I just would, I want to make sure that that uh, we have the all of the answers before we push something out, and then we'll have to change something. So we're expecting to get that hopefully soon. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Mr. Orwig. I think that's very accurate and then the other the other piece that i would say is and if you're not aware the piaa is meeting today at 2 p.m and not a lot of this is on that agenda what will be added to their could be added to their agenda i'm not aware of but what you look at publicly right now uh they don't seem to be addressing anything further than what we've just discussed the other specific question that I have, previous uh, mask requirements, they allowed mask breaks in schools. 
I want to get clarification. Does that still apply or is that off the table? And so those are the few things that I want to make sure that we understand before we uh, push something out. Um, and again, we're, we're going to try to do that as soon as we get the answers to the questions. like to make uh, another comment if I could. I think we, we have to keep in mind that we have to think of ourselves as not just the school. We have to think of ourselves as, as just an entity within the community. And when we think about this stuff, we, we can't just think that we are protecting the school or protecting our students, but we're also uh, protecting Gettysburg Hospital and Hanover Hospital and the greater good of the community. So if when, when we make a decision like, uh, are we going to continue to play sports? Are we going to put masks on student athletes? And that just sounds awful to me, by the way. I can't imagine wrestling or playing basketball with a mask on. I think I would suffocate. But um, we have to think of that as being part of the greater good of Adams County and not just the greater good of Bermudian Springs School District. I just think we need to keep that in the back of our mind because I know that what else was said in the, in the Department of Health release is that they're concerned about um, hospitalizations going into December and, and what that might look like. And uh, I don't wanna be sick, really sick, sitting in a waiting room, waiting for somebody to die so that I can get a hospital bed. And I think we have to keep that in mind. Just all of us here, even you guys sitting in the audience, we need to think about that. And not just Bermudian Springs School District, but the greater good of South Central Pennsylvania. That's all, thank you. Just so we don't go down that rabbit trail quite yet, um, we're going to be having more discussion about that a little later. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Orwig. Anybody else have any questions for Mr. Orwig? Thank you. Next, I'd like to share with you a, a presentation we put together with some data. The last meeting you asked, um, I shared with you that Adams County had moved into the substantial um, category um, we had a conference call with PDE with some data from the Department of Health that we were then supposed to get an update on Friday. I did push out a communication and prior to that email, we hadn't received the official uh, notification from PDE. We eventually did and as predicted, Adams County stayed in the uh, substantial category as a county. You asked me to provide some more granular data. And so that's what I'd like to share with you now based on um, some specific zip code information. So what you're viewing right here is a chart that we are keeping internally um, and we're using four areas and I'll talk about the areas a little bit later on. So you can see York Springs, East Berlin Gardeners, New Oxford. You can see that uh, the confirmed and the probables. These are cumulative numbers since March. So don't get alarmed when you see the numbers. This is a cumulative total. What we're, what we're doing is tracking each day what the numbers are by zip code. And then all the way to the right, we're um, tracking the total change from the previous day, okay? So prior, the last meeting was the ninth, so we're back to the ninth. We were able to pull uh, the total by um, those four zip codes prior to November 8th, but since the 9th or since the 9th, we've been doing it by each area. Okay. So this is something we do on a daily basis. We also have been utilizing um, another website that creates um, some charts for us. They package things a little bit differently. They pull uh, the department information. And so this is uh, what it looks like. This is the Bermudian Springs School District. I do want to share with you um, that this data source, um, when you break down our school district, they use the uh, six zip codes. They've included Dillsburg, Abbottstown, East Berlin, Gardeners, New Oxford, and York Springs. Okay. I want you to, so 
for the first few slides for the number of days, I will share the information related to, to those zip codes. I've also done some data collection. Um, I'll just give you, for instance, we have zero households in our school district connected to Abbottstown. So I'm not sure why they have Abbottstown there, but I'm gonna show you two different pictures and explain that. So I just want you to see. So what this is, is the geographic boundary of the district. You can see that see the level of transmission is substantial. But what I want you to look at as we go through the slides are these two numbers. So the first number are the incident rate per 100,000. If you remember to get in substantial in Pennsylvania, once that number reaches over 100 per 100,000, that's one of the indicators. The next number are the, uh, the percent of those tested that have tested positive, okay? So those two numbers are what you'll be able to see. And then they break it down. You can, you can break this down by zip code. So this is, the, this is what it looked like the last time we met, November 9th, okay? So if you take a look, November 10th, so if you go back, let me, you can see we're at 106 and basically 13. So we go to 112, a little bit more than 13. Here's the 11th. Here's the 12th. And then here's Friday the 13th. And so now we've gone from the low 100s. So now per, per 100,000, we were 177. Positivity rate was 19. Going to the 14. 14th. The rate per 100,000 came down a little bit, but the percent positive has gone above 20%. Okay. And then this was November 16th, November 17th, and there's the 18th. Okay. So currently, this was as of this morning. Now, keep in mind, this is all of those zip codes, okay? So this is the actual numbers for those zip codes. And so I wanted to filter them out. So New Oxford, we do have students with a 17350 uh, zip code. We have actually 614 homes with that zip code. But New Oxford, what you see in the data is actually 5,524 uh, homes are 11 percent. So that number, the full 5,524 homes were calculated into those first numbers. Okay. Dillsburg, you can see we only have 38 houses out of over 18,000, which is 0 0.002. And then Abbottstown, I'm not sure why, zero. So the next series, I'm going to show you the same slides with those three zip codes factored out. Okay. I couldn't get down to Grand and pick and choose the 614, but if you take a look you know, if you looked at uh, New Oxford zip, there were, if there were eight, an increase of eight cases, and we're looking at 10%, it's less than one case that would be attributed if you do it based on strictly percentages. But I think it's important that you see that context and you all have that piece of data, okay? Well, since you part with Dillsburg, I guess I can leave. <laughs> <laughs> so now, if you remember, this was the first date on the board meeting. So we were over 100. And so once you, once you narrow down to just East Berlin, Gardners, and York Springs, we were at 78 and 8.9%. And on the 10th, 96 to 10%. And here was the 11th. Now we jumped to 126 and 12. The 12th, 138 and up to 14. And then this was Friday the 13th. Uh, was, was a big spike in the, on, the, on the five. So here we were up to 162 and just a little under 17% positivity rate. 14th, um, which was a Saturday, we jumped to 180 and we were almost uh, a little over 21%. Then the 15th came down to 162 and 20. And we came down to 150 and 19. And we jumped back up just a little bit to 162. This was yesterday. And then here is today, 138 and 17.29. So this is always updated based on the last seven days. So it takes a, a day out and then it recalculates. Um, and again, this still indicates that we're insubstantial. So I, I will predict that Adams County will be insubstantial again once the next round comes out based on the data that we're seeing now, okay? And then this is our current, uh, to give you another data point, this is what we currently have in our schools. We had uh, two uh, confirmed cases and that those have been 
previous, they've, they've been out for some time. We currently have 18, uh, this is students or staff that have been exposed and, and or quarantined. And then three that are currently identified as having some symptoms and risk factors. And so um, our building principals have done a great job collecting information. Um, I try to update this when I see our own internal numbers have changed, but this was as of just a few hours ago, the latest and greatest uh, numbers. And so that was your ask. If you wanted to see what it looked like for just Bermudian Springs. Um, there we are. Um, I don't want to jinx, but it's been uh, more than our last positive case in the district was more than a week ago. We do have some new cases of folks have been quarantined, exposed. And the pattern that we're seeing is it's all, we haven't seen school to school. So we believe somebody um, tested positive because of an interaction that they've had in school. When we talk with individuals, it seems like it's related, it's something from home, a parent or a family member, um, as students get older, it's uh, boyfriend, girlfriends. Um, those, that seems to be the common pattern that we're seeing now with those that are, are quarantined or have been exposed or those um, situations. Shane, do you have information on the number of teachers, our teacher model? I know we were discussing at some point, the, at, like Fairfield lost a bunch of teachers at one mm -hmm. point. What's our teacher numbers look like? Well, how, what's so, our percent? So about, a week and a half ago, we were we were up to the five and six out in one building, and it was a struggle to find that has since come down. Um, but yeah, getting substitutes even at one or two has been a challenge at times. And I appreciate we a lot of our staff have done coverages. We've had to pull some specialists to cover classes um, so that we can make sure that that our students had that that teacher there face to face. And I really appreciate just many staff members who, who've stepped up. Uh, but that's the, we haven't seen anything like some of our neighboring districts that was out in the paper today, but that's, that's a conversation. Um, I know I've talked with our uh, assistant principals and principals that in the morning when we check our system ASOP and if we have a real high percentage, like we'll need to know um, if that's something that we can staff each day, knock on wood. Um, we haven't reached a level yet where it just, we couldn't even cover classes. Dr. Hotchkiss, is five or six kind of the number per building? And how often do we hit that in other years? Uh, th that does seem to be our number. And I'll have to turn to our building principals how often we're hitting those numbers. Elementary school, how often are you hitting? Yeah, on any given day. Middle school? Um, we're in the same boat. I think that we average on a daily basis five or six staff members who are out. I would say just about every day we've had to provide coverage for a teacher who was out, but we've been able to provide the coverage for the most part. Um, so we average five or six, again, for various reasons. I mean, today we had 10 absences. Um, so our five or six are because of long-term subs or um, your long absences, kind of your typical. But on a day like today, we had 10 absences. Two of them were unfilled um, and we have to pull together coverage. But so I'd say pretty much at least one position on a daily basis needs some kind of coverage. Do you think is that different than it is in other years? Is, is this year been atypical that way? I don't know necessarily for this particular building since I'm still um, kind of new, but I would say that it's not uncommon to have to cover an absence, but it's not daily in a typical year. And this has been pretty daily. And that's honestly evidence of our lack of substitute teachers that are in the pool, not just here, but all over of trying to get people in. High school.
Dr. Hodgkiss. Dr. Hodgkiss, what could, um, you had mentioned that as of today, uh, in the recent, you know, numbers, we have two confirmed cases in the district. What's, um, do you, can you give us the average of what that normally is, or maybe the high and low? What are the most number of cases we've had? in the last like month or two? The highest number of cases that, that people have tested positive at any one time was three. Um, and we keep them on there for the duration of the time that they're out. So we've been sending out notifications, you know, when appropriate. And so, so sometimes um, we, you know, we've had instances where, um, you know, if we have a student that is uh, full, cyber and they've never been in the building and we catch wind of it like we wouldn't necessarily report that out because it wouldn't have any bearing on on the school um so at any one time the most we've had is three and like i said and i, I wanted to give you the context that the two that are on here have been about nine days So I, I'll just reiterate that I believe um, the mitigation strategies that we currently have in place in all of our schools are being effective. Um, you know, the fact that we, you know, have class sizes on average, nothing greater than 12, and we have some as low as six, um, which means we're able to still, you know, space apart, we're able to accomplish that in cafeterias, the washing of the hands and the due diligence. We've really had no issues. Our students have been great um with being mindful of all of those things and it's like anything else we always want to remind people to make sure we're wearing masks you know just be mindful of your situation make sure you use hand sanitizer wash your hands um, we've even put safeguards in place related to technology when we have issues um, where in the past we would probably sit next to somebody and fix their problem now we we've amped up our loaners so we're more apt to give somebody a loaner take their device wipe it down take care of it that way, solve the problem and then give it back just to make sure that we're not spending a lot of close contact time with those individuals. And we've done that at all buildings um, and that's worked out well. We've also increased our ability to provide remote support that way so that we can kind of minimize. So, um, you know, and this is, this is just a credit to all of the staff. Um, it's on the minds of everybody. Um, and I feel like in the district right now for what's in, in the schools, um, I feel like when I look at these, the, the number of cases, and again, the comparison is all of those around us. I feel like that we're in a, a pretty good spot um, from the number of cases that have happened in our schools that when I hear, you know, conversations from my colleagues um, across the counties, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Dr. Fox to kind of give you an update. And so RIU is, consists of um, Franklin, Adams, York County, but we also, uh, we border Cumberland County. Um, and uh, so I've asked Dr. Fox to kind of pull some information together at a high level to give everyone a glimpse of those around us and what it looks like for schools. And each day you see more people going remote um, and, and making some changes. So not that we're gonna give any schools, but we wanna give you a glimpse into our geographic area, kind of what those numbers look like from a so I'll ask Dr. Fox to share out districts that have moved to full remote and our, our reach are those three counties. And, and I've said nothing beyond uh, going up to the river, uh, you know, staying on this side of, of the Susquehanna River and just giving you a, just giving you a glimpse as to what we're and this is to the best of our ability. We're trying to work on as an IU like a hub to create together this information. So we'll do that and then we'll talk about just uh, the number of actually school closures that are more strategic and targeted where the whole district didn't have to close, but you're looking at schools. Yeah, thanks. Uh, certainly, 
it, it was a challenge trying to locate the amount of different uh, school districts because again, to the best of our ability, we we're able to pull some information. So it looked at a five county area uh, throughout central Pennsylvania and it looks like uh, seven districts uh, total within that five county area. And when we say the five county area, we're saying Adams, Cumberland, uh, York, uh, Dauphin and Franklin. Um, it looks like individual uh, schools um, at the elementary level it, it appears there's eight uh, schools at the elementary level. Um, at the middle school level, 15 schools and uh, 14 high schools uh, throughout the five county area. Now, again, that was as of uh, yesterday, uh, last evening. And again, uh, to the best of our ability of, of obtaining information that was available either on the website or was uh, sent to us um, in other information and mediums. Fox, do you have an idea how many school districts that encompasses? Is there 50 school districts in that five county area? Or do you have an idea? Um, but the RIU, um, 25 school districts. So you're probably not quite to the 50 level. So Dr. Fox, cl please clarify. How many districts are fully virtual? Districts that are fully virtual are seven at this point. Again, that I was able to, to locate information on. That include <clears throat> a little less than 50. And does that include the districts that are going fully virtual beginning Thanksgiving break? Because there have been a number that have announced that that is their plan. Yes, as, as of last evening, that's, that's the information I was able to find, yep. But some of those districts may have five or six elementary schools. Absolutely. And I, I have uh, closures at the elementary level. I, I, I did not take it down to the amount of elementary schools because, again, you look at certain districts, you're exactly right. There could be six elementary schools. There could be, it could be 14 in some. Um, so I did not take it down so that granularly. Out of 200 to 300 elementary schools. I doubt that it's that high. Um, but y y the number is more than, more than 50 elementary schools for sure. Well, you, but you'd also have to back out the districts where the entire district is going. Virtual. I'm sorry. I see you'd also have to back out the districts that have already gone fully virtual. So a district that has 10 elementary schools where they've gone fully virtual, that's an, that's an addition to the seven that are right. So Dr. Fox, did you count, um, vote tech and all and all those i'm just curious because i'm looking someone sent me an article from the patriot news and just in cumberland and dolphin county i'm counting 11 districts in those two counties so i'm just you know i'm not questioning your you know integrity i'm just saying i'm seeing other data well and again we have to do this by hand so depending upon the date this is what we're going out and checking websites um, and I got to tell you, I read an article of another school that closed uh, in Dauphin County just earlier today that's going to happen after the break. So we're just trying to give you a glimpse. The goal was not to go into count, just trying to give you a general idea. Um, and definitely you, you um, see the patterns of schools um, that have been face to face um, that have that have closed. I mean, there have been some hybrid schools that have definitely had to close and have gone uh, remote. Um, is also for, for Mr. Wool then too. At one point, maybe we'd um, discuss, we know from our feedback from our parents that our parents would really like to hear more communication and, and discussion next. between the board members. That's next. Oh, sorry, I didn't That's mean right. to jump ahead then. <laughs> then never mind. Then. How would you not? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> well, I had, um, this is Jen Zerfine. I had one other um issue as a matter of and maybe this is something to talk about in the next section but um as we have been making these decisions we've looked <clears throat> a good deal at whether our community was low moderate or substantial for spread and one of the things that in my mind helped justify being hybrid was that 
we were in the moderate spread and we had to choose between hybrid or fully remote. And at that point in time, we chose the most face-to-face -face instructional model that we could. And so, um, you know, as justification to why we didn't go back fully face-to-face, -face, that to me, that moderate spread was a pretty good indicator. If I follow that to the logical conclusion, then according to what I'm basing my decision on, then if we're insubstantial for a certain number of weeks, certainly not a knee jerk reaction, but after a certain amount of time at that point, then um, if we're not going fully virtual, we're considering other criteria. And I would like to really flesh out what, what that criteria is, not just for, you know, moving fully virtual, but also face to face, if, if that makes sense. So you're correct. Uh, you know, I, I, one, I don't think we ever, as a board, agreed that we would follow the the model that the state put together to the letter. Um, so, you know, we hit substantial spread a week ago. Uh, I, I think that you know, and, and we're see, we're already seeing even in the data that that Dr. Hodgkin shared, there's pretty significant variation as basically as days rolls off because. Though you know our case count per hundred thousand is high, uh, our population is still low, right? And so you don't get to have, you know, I, what is our total population for our district? Meaning of people? Do we know that? Do you know that off the top of your head? I do not know the exact count. Is it over a hundred thousand? It's not over a hundred thousand. So, which means that you get one person, you're over one percent already, right? So, and, and that's the part that gets, that can get, get tricky because you're, you know, because our sampling size is, is smaller. Um, so that's part of the reason why I, I don't think we, per we purposely did not necessarily say we're going to do exactly based on what the state guidelines were, but you, you have to look at also, you have to look at trends, you know, are we, are we moving in the right direction? You know, the fact that we're seeing kind of a, a porpoising, you know, an up and down, uh, you know, if, if it were a steady incline, we'd probably be thinking one thing. If it's a steady decline, we're probably thinking something different. And, and the one thing I want to be clear about, the, is, as much as the zip code data is important, and even as Dr. Hotchkiss even tried to narrow it down, our community does not, for the most part, work and shop in our school, school district boundaries. Because let's face it, there isn't a lot of opportunity to do that. So our community is interacting with the greater community. And, and we, we've seen that it's, it, it appears, at least our experience, is that a lot of the cases that, get, that are, quote, brought into the district aren't brought in. People aren't coming here and getting sick. They are bringing it in from being, getting, it, getting it somewhere else. And the, the impact to us is the exposure, which leads to quarantining. So, and, and the reason why that, that's, that, that's, I wanted to call that out is when you think about, and I think this is probably based on the number of the questions that we've gotten from a couple of you. One of the concerns is, is we, if we lose too many teachers, we're gonna have a hard time teaching anybody in any method. So, so we do have to be mindful of that as well. Um, you know, I, I wish I could say that there was, was a science to this, but there's a reason why I, I think no, nobody's taken the dogmatic approach based on just the raw numbers. Uh, so trending, uh, and to be honest with you, I don't think a weak trend is necessarily enough. Certainly two weeks, then you start to, you know, you kind of start to get out because, you know, they're, they're taking a snapshot pretty much on a weekly basis, right? Uh, what you can see here, is at a daily basis? No, I'm talking about the Department of Health. Though. The Department of Health does it on a weekly basis. So we have Week ending on Thursday. We have two data points, really, right? And two data points don't make a trend. So, um, and that's where it gets into how quickly do we move, right? Um, I'm not saying that we're not gonna make a decision to go fully virtual, or we want it's time to go back fully face-to-face. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that 
and we've talked about this, the issue of coming up with something that is very prescriptive is that you could hit quote a metric, but there's a piece of data that we didn't have at the time to, to consider that might change our minds or have an impact on that decision one way or the other. And that's something we have to, we also have to have to think about. So. This is Amanda. I just, I'm not, I mean, I'm concerned with the data that I'm seeing, I'll, but I also am not, I would be considering the hybrid model, continuing it based on where we are. However, what concerns me is the exposure that's going to happen at Thanksgiving and hit us two weeks later in our school where we won't have the time to pivot as easily as we would if we gave families a week and a half notice, knowing that the trend of family gatherings is going to up our numbers likely if we're following national trends. So we would have our kids come back after Thanksgiving, then our spike would come two weeks later, and then we would maybe go remote, then there's Christmas. And by that point, by the time the Christmas spike happens, we're at the end of the second marking period. And so my, I guess my question concern, if we're going to make a big pivot, is it better to give the teachers, the parents, the kids a week and a half notice to make that pivot so that we can put some things in, in place, like having a school that's open for kids who really need to be in school for proctoring and warmth and food, rather than just fully close every single building, but leave, some, leave a building open to provide that outreach that those kids need. And I guess if we're gonna take on something like that, if we think that we're headed down the road to closure, or to fully remote, sorry, then giving ourselves the time to do it right is also unfortunately right now too, where we aren't sure where our data is. So I just wanted to say my piece on that. Any other comments? And the only thing I would, you know, caution is that we're basing something on what somebody thinks may happen. Uh, now, we've done that before. Uh, it's going to be a question of degrees, right? How, 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 how bad is it, is it going to be? Absolutely. I'll take this as an opportunity to tell you, and we've shared this um, even back in the summertime, that outwardly people see the planning of one event. However, we've had to plan for multiple scenarios. We plan for hybrid, we plan for full face-to-face, -face, and we've planned for full virtual. And so we've had a committee, our professional development committee um, and others review. We we've, um, have a pretty detailed plan if we were to go to virtual. Um, we've had it reviewed, we've shared it out, and we're still continuing to refine, you know, refine that. And so I've, I've been hesitant. I haven't, as a district, wanted to share that out because I didn't want anybody to think that this is happening. But I also think it's important that everybody hears now, like, we have a plan. Um, it's down at the teacher level. Um, we had a, a cabinet meeting yesterday with our administrative team, and we've, we've shared that teachers can talk to students that in the event that were to happen, what, they would, what it would look like, how, where would they go to get information on their class and try to talk through all of that at that individual level versus pushing something out as a, as a district level. And I'll be honest with you, we are also um, talking to other districts that have made the switch and kind of learning from them, like what works for you when you made the switch to virtual, what didn't work for you, and then constantly reviewing our plan. So I do want everybody to know that we, we have a plan. Um, when and or if ever we needed to implement it, we could do that. Um, and, uh, kind of like that if, uh, if and or when um, we get kids back to face to face, we talked the last time about the phases of how we'd wanna phase them in, all we would need is a timeline to do that. Um, and there would be some things that we, we definitely have to do. I talked before about furniture and, and moving those type of things. We've already talked about storage. So we, we've got 
plans in place that are that are definitely at a good enough stage to to shift gears. Um, I won't claim that it's perfect, but I feel very good with the conversations that have been had, the leadership, the the uh, feedback, the input that has taken place, um, you know, across the district on that. And that's been going on for several months. So I just wanted you guys all to know that. Um, We've been working and, and people across the have been working really hard on that. Dr. Hutchkiss, one thing I've heard parents concerned about is if we switch uh, back and forth between plans, how disruptive or how seamless, what does that look like to you? Yeah, I mean, that, that is the concern. Um, if you, if you, that's why I think it's important. Uh, we don't make a knee jerk reaction that if you continue to go back and forth, obviously our ultimate goal is to make it as seamless as possible. Um, I think that that's idealistic, but anytime you go from, uh, even think about board meetings, we're, we're here virtually and we don't get to see anybody to try to provide pretty direct instruction. Um, we, we actually did, um, I want to say pilot the protocol for a classroom, um, about a week ago and it worked well. The feedback from parents was very, very positive. Um, there definitely has um, been some conversation um, across the district saying, hey, do we wanna practice a day um, in the event we, we would need to go? And that's just, you know, that's, that's been a conversation that we've had. Um, but yeah, you, you hit on something that is, that is something that I worry about is the seesaw back and forth and continuity. And I think about just the impact on families. And so that's why I appreciate the very, the amount of thought you've put into it. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know that we can point to any one thing that's going to be like, that's the one thing that's going to lead to a decision. Um, the only thing in my mind that would do that is that we get an edict from somebody from the state or to the department of health that says, no, you are, um, Outside of that, it really is. And their goal all along from the Department of Health has been it's a local decision. Um, and every school district around us has been grappling. And I can tell you those that are those that have switched to remote now have been primarily, and I don't want to say I don't know a hundred percent sure at everybody, but they're because of active cases in their schools. And so when you're seeing that, it's because they've been seeing those, they've been getting some guidance. That's why they're they're shifting and they're going to remote, whether it's a school or the district, because it's just been so widespread. I can't say that it's been a hundred percent of them, but I can tell you a vast majority it's because of the, the activity within the school buildings. The other thing that I, I wonder, and this is just speculation, I don't expect anybody to have the answer maybe, but um, I just wonder if, you know, going to what Amanda was talking about, about the, the spike that could be likely with Thanksgiving and Christmas and stuff like that. And so I just wonder if, if going fully remote in the short term would make it more likely that we could go fully face to face, like why couldn't we go from fully remote back to fully face to face um, in, a, in a few months? I just, I wonder if that would be more likely or do you think if we went fully face to face um, before a lot of substantial changes that we just end up fully remote again. So my initial response is kind of like all of the, the conversation, the data that we reviewed that, that would impact a potential decision that, that you all make to go um, full remote. And I, so let me, let me back up and just preface it. Districts that have shifted to remote for the temporary stage has been done at the superintendent level because of uh, recommendations from the Department of Health. If you choose to switch, and, and this is that there's no magical line, the instructional model for the health and safety plan, that's you, okay? And, and to me, if you look around, like people that are going remote has been, you know, just a, a couple of weeks. And so sometimes, if, so if we were to get a call that says, listen, we, we need to shut down for a little while, and we're not sure of the time, I would come back to the, to the board and we would determine the length. But what you're seeing now is a lot because of the number of cases, the recommendation by the Department of Health is to shut down for this two weeks, the shutdown. There have been a few districts who've made the decision to go past January, and that's been done at the board level because uh, they just wanted to kind of prolong that. So there has been, a, and listen, there's no guide for that. Um, there's no, you know, this is just us kind of talking based on those recommendations. And so just, we want to keep that in mind. And so I, go back to your uh, original all about the, the probability of, of uh, 
coming back face to face. Um, and man, I, I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, and what I would say for the seriousness that you've had conversations about going fully remote, we want to do that face to face. So I think it would take some sustained low levels um, at the county, the low transmission levels. Um, and we would look granular at the, at the district level. I think as much as we're looking to not to not go remote if we don't have to, we would also want to use the same process and thought and data review to bring it back face to face and have this prolonged period of time where like, okay, things are stabilized. Um, I think that, that that's important on both ends. So that, that would be the, unless there's more they want to talk about. So we have, um, did you give everybody a copy? Do you want me to? Yes. So there is a, a document that, that, I, that I worked on and Shane has also reviewed that we're going to review here. Uh, and then um, we can, by the way, you, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Just so you know, that this is a, what you're about to experience is what I do on a very routine basis is we do we don't do powerpoint for the most part at amazon we write documents and then we sit down in the meeting in the first 10 15 minutes of the meeting people read the document and then we basically do a, a group review and make the doc but the best it can be so the intent is and the reason why of course want everybody's skin in this is because it's going out from all of us not just me so we're going to be all in this boat together uh, so when the torpedoes start coming, it's not just me. <laughs> so anyhow, let's just take a few minutes, uh, read the doc, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk after that.
my, when you're ready to get started again then too, I'd just like to say, I think I'd like to talk about how we distribute it before we talk about the actual thing, just because I feel the how might get lost later on in the discussion when we're talking the details of it, if that's agreeable to you. Yeah, and I'd actually rather get through the content first, because that could change the how actually. Are, is, are, are we? Can, I'm sorry. I used to be able to talk, and then I just lost that ability. Cause That's because you put a mask on. <laughs> can I? Can I talk about two sentences? Yeah. Can why don't we wait till everybody's done? Oh, I'm sorry. It's thought, right. yeah. Already? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Understand. Ready? Yes. Okay. The, 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 there's only two sentences that I, that I would like to talk about. It would be easy. Uh, one of them would be in the, uh, I don't know if it's a third or fourth paragraph, but the, the one that says, as we completed the first quarter marking period, the overall performance of our students is on par with previous year. At our last board meeting, a lot of people had contention with that. And I think, I don't know if you need to put that in there. I think a lot of people will read that sentence and just set this aside and say, that's bull crap. I don't need to read that. And I'm not sure that that sentence is necessary. Okay. I, I can understand why you would want to put it in there. Yeah, the data reflected that. The, the data did reflect that, <laughs> but there'll be people that will argue that. I, I understand. Yeah, and I, I, understand. I don't think you want people to argue with you in this letter. So that, that was my only okay. thought, Rick. is that you want people to read this and not say, oh, he's, oh, he's full of crap, because my kid's failing, and he doesn't usually fail. So Rich. this letter lost credibility with that sense. That's my only thought. Can I offer a counterpoint to you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I had the opportunity to talk to a parent this past Thursday at my kid's Cub Scout meeting who wants her kids in school face-to-face -face five days a week. And she and I spent about 30 minutes discussing the various reasons why we are doing what we're doing, how we've been able to maximize in face it, or in school instructional time because we haven't had to close any of our schools. We've only had to limit one or two, I think one classroom has had to close. Um, and that our, and I pointed out that our kids are performing at the same level they were at the previous year. And that the information that we received in that October was it the October board meeting where we were seeing the slump in grades that that was 
corrected at the end of the marking period and that our children did accomplish appropriate grade level achievements by that point. So I will throw that out as a, as a debate point, um, just as a counter perspective. Right. The purpose of this letter is not to debate that. The purpose of this letter is informational about hybrid and remote. Yeah, I, I agree, but it's also informational to people that frankly don't know this right. or even, even had an opportunity to disagree. Because if, if I, frankly, this is probably gonna have a broader distribution than just parents. If I'm a community member and I would say, oh, well, the students are doing on average, the same okay. as they did last year, right? I mean, because th that's really the, the reason we're here is to make sure that our students being educated. Right. Uh, I, don't get me wrong, Rich, I hear what you're saying. Right. I, I just, I also don't want to tailor it to, you know, a, a, a subset of our entire community because what we do here, as to your point earlier, impacts not just our students, our faculty, Right. The families of our students, but also everybody else in the community that these people interact with. Right. So okay. That's, okay. That that would be my yeah. That, that's okay. And, right. I, I, and did, I actually I, I get it. I get it. Just I think so I wove that in there a little bit too. Okay. No, it's all right. Yeah. But the other sentence was it, well, uh, is the, the, the like almost the last sentence. Uh, stakeholder and we and will adjust based on feedback and the data. Uh, what what if that just said based on the needs of the school district, which is a more as determined by who the school board and the administration. I'm a data kind of guy. Well, you can say data. Here's I'm I'm coming back to the same I, circle. I, I know I, I I that I do get you there. Um, yeah. We put out that survey and we took a lot of heat about that survey <laughs> and that was feedback. And we didn't listen to the feedback necessarily. We looked at it, but we didn't necessarily follow. So what, I want to clarify, we listened to it. We may not have agreed with it. Exactly. Okay, I want to yeah, but be clear. We did listen to it. Yeah, that's that, better said, Mike, thank you. But, but, but that word feedback, feedback uh, is a, a little bit different. All right, maybe I, there's a better word. So I'm thinking maybe we will we will adjust based on the data, but and not, the needs of our community. Except that we're not changing it based on the data. The department of that's one piece of data. That's one piece, but we are not necessarily. We're making some decisions based on data, some based on community knowing that our community has a smaller population under 100,000 people, knowing that the cases are coming into our community from other places, not being root caused by the school. And, but if you were just gonna look at the Mainline Mama website, it would say, you're substantial, your data says you should shut down. But you, wait, those other items you just gave, that's data. See, see that the thing is, if feedback comes into us and a hundred people fill the auditorium and say, regardless of how many people died in the high school yesterday, you need to go to full face-to-face -face instruction. And they say, that's, that's what, what you need to do. And we say, no, we're not going to do it. Then we're not listening to their feedback. That's, that's my point. I think the overall idea the, of the statement, one of the reasons I've been a big proponent of this with Mike has just been the idea that we are starting to communicate with parents in our community in ways that we haven't before. So we're gonna list that we're going to use feedback criteria. The, the way you rewrote the sentence I thought was really good, Mike. It doesn't mean though that any one of those things is gonna be the definitive answer today of what we're gonna make our decision, that we're gonna continue to focus on all of these different criteria and then make our decision that it, Right now, we're saying with this statement, it, it looks to say the same till the end of the marking period, but maybe it'll change next week or as the data and other feedback continue to come in, then we can make our decision. And I think just communicating that to our parents and our community 
is a positive step. It's exactly what the parents have been looking for and want from us. So I think letting them know that we are reviewing whichever word we prefer to use, feedback, data, criteria, however that goes, is a, is a move forward. And that's to let them know what we're thinking. And I think that's what we've accomplished. I'll just add, I, I wanna give you this context. I just went back to look at the survey and I think it's always important to check back and, and check ourselves as a checks and balance. And so at the beginning of the last survey, the parent survey that you're referencing, we, yep. we, we shared at the beginning of the survey and in the purpose of, of what was happening, the purpose of the survey is to gather feedback from parents, guardians, and students on appropriate adjustments to our current instructional model. Their survey will ask participants to consider several options that are the feedback collected from this survey in conjunction with other information. For example, teacher survey results, county positivity rate per 100,000 residents, current case numbers in the school district, staffing issues. And I share that because you've discussed every single one of those in this meeting. And so I just want to want to point out like that was what, what we had said as a, as a district that was going to enter into your decision making and, and, and influence. And so uh, I just want to share because I think it's a really good checks and balance for us as an entity. So I wanted to add that in. So this is Jen. I, I overall like the letter, although I don't necessarily agree that I think we should be staying in hybrid, but that's a different discussion. Um, the thing I'm, I'm hearing what everyone is saying about the feedback and the data and the, the criteria that we're talking about. But um, if I'm going to step back and pretend I'm not a board member and pretend I'm a parent, um, when, I, when I read this letter, the part that really sticks out to me is on the second page, the, the bullet points that say, here's phase one, here's phase two, here's phase three. Because as a parent, I want to know what's it going to look like for my kid if we, if we go fully remote. And I trust she, Dr. Hotchkiss that you have a plan because I've been working with you for three years and I've seen that when the board tells you to act, you have already been thinking about it. You're very good at implementing what the board tells you to do. So as a board member, I have, I have faith in that. But as a parent, I have questions like, well, is that going to be synchronous remote learning or asynchronous remote learning? And so I feel like as a parent, I'd like to see not your whole plan. I don't, I'm not asking for that, but I think that parents would benefit from seeing just, just the, the outline of here's what that would look like. Here's what the transition to face-to-face -to -face would look like, which it looks like, uh, Mike, you have provided a little bit of that. Uh, it says that Friday will become a full instructional day under phase one. I don't understand that piece, but what I'm saying is I would like this letter to be a little bit more of what's in those bullet points, plus a little bit more of what fully remote would look like so that even if we do have to go there, at least parents aren't like, oh my God, what's that going to be? I, just to give that as a parent is the kind of information that, that I would want if I didn't have a three-year working relationship with you. So let me respond a couple times. We actually did describe the what virtual learning would look like last meeting with Dr. Fox, and it will be synchronous and asynchronous, um, which means there'll be live teachers in front of kids every day. We've limited the amount of time, uh, but that definitely is part of the plan. And as far as the return, um, the phases that we talked about and the recommendation is the, to phase, phase in, kindergarten through fourth grade, what we mean for uh, Friday will become a full day of instruction. If last time I shared, it's extremely difficult related to transportation. Fridays right now are half a day. And so what I mean by that is um, K to four and come back face to face. Everybody would be the students for their hybrid schedule. So the secondary level, okay? Because this is phase one, K to four face to face. Students in grades five through 12 would stay cherry and steel, but Friday would become a full day, no longer a half a day. That, that, that's what that means. Um, so to your point or your question about more detail, what, I'm, what I would probably suggest is that that is something that would be added as a link out of this doc, because 
I gotta be honest with you. And um, when I get letters and emails this long, I lose attention. If I have to scroll, I, I lose attention. And part of it's because of just the, the fact I sit in front of a computer all day, sifting through literally hundreds of emails. So that's why my team knows if they have something important to say, they better do it. So that's in that first paragraph. Um, so I, I don't want to have too much in here because it applies to some, but not all. So the stuff that's in here, you, you want it to kind of be the big bang type things, the things that really apply to the, the, the majority of your, of our audience of, of, of this, when you start getting down to, you know, what is it like going to be coming back in a high school or if we go virtual in the high school versus the elementary school versus the middle school, um, I, I would, you know, if we want to put some, get some documentation out there, have that as, as a link off, you know, click here to find out more of what you can plan to expect. I really like that idea. So I, I want to make sure better. just, I've been very cautious about that. I don't want all parents to think we're going virtual. That's why I've been hesitant to push anything out. So I want to make sure that I hear from the board and that you're prepared if you get questions, and that's why I'm saying this publicly now, if we do that, I don't want people to walk away thinking that it's happening because we're sharing something out. Well, we're gonna be sharing both virtual and face-to-face. -face. So from the face-to-face, -face, we'll share the phase. I wanna clarify what you're reading, what you've read in the phases. Phase two is actually grades five and six. And so we will make that clarification. So phase two, and here was the goal and I, I shared last time, is originally we were gonna bring K to six back face to face and then we changed our mind. And the reason that we would do phase two, five to six, we can still continue to isolate kids in kindergarten through sixth grade. We can rotate teachers in. Once you get to seventh grade, the schedule is a uh, 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 schedule of classes for kids is just too much. You can't just isolate a group of kids because of the way their schedules work. So phase three would actually be seven through 12, okay? So outside of a, a plan to return, that's what the plan would be. You would see um, in classrooms, um, similar to now, you know, not a lot of extra furniture, but outside of that, we, we, there would not be um, any changes to our current practice other than all K through four kids are gonna come back. Um, at the building level, we'll, we'll outline, and, um, and here's the hesitancy, I'm not gonna outline what the cafeteria will be because it's going to be based on numbers, how we're going to eat lunch. We know we're going to do everything we can to try to separate kids in the cafeteria. Uh, districts that, and I share this as well, districts that have brought kids back have used classrooms, they've used gymnasiums, they've used cafeterias. And so we would work on what that would look like. And I, I, I don't, I don't think we're in a position that we could commit. This is what it would look like because it really is going to be dictated by numbers. And so if we, when we, uh, return face to face whenever that would be. We will definitely push something out to get a, to, to get a gauge from uh, the community. Are you going to send your child back so that we can start planning for numbers? Or if you're going to, more than likely, it'll probably be, are you going to make a change from your current instructional approach because we have those numbers so that we can, so get, we can a get a general idea, idea and begin, idea to begin to plan. But as far but as, as far coming as back, coming back, the building, building we'll, we'll have to make some adjustments of, of uh, you know classrooms, you know, classrooms and, furniture, and furniture. But to but me, the, to most, me, the most important thing is. Thing is Phasing, phasing, phasing in. in. And I also, and I also think, think that we could phase, phase, go from phase, phase one, one to phase, phase two quicker than, than I would, would go phase two to phase three. Phase and the biggest, and the biggest difference, difference and we, we talked earlier is once, once you, you get, get phase, phase three, three kids, kids are going, going everywhere, everywhere, grades seven through 12. They're intermixing. There's no limits. And when, and again, when you're looking at, at districts now that have that, that's kind of what caused those cases in, in their buildings because you're, you, you know, a student can come in contact with, you know, several hundred different students within a day. We're K to six, we get to that point, we can kind of isolate. So um, I think um, the also, the, the other thing we talked about in the summer is we're, we're making decisions and you're doing that now based on conditions, not a timeline. And so, you know, I think from the phase, I think we've got the phases outlined. Um, in phase one, K to four would come back. All Friday would be a full instructional day. Students in grades five through 12 would still be in their hybrid schedules, cherry, steel. But if they're to attend school on a Friday, it would be all day, not a half a day. Phase two, bring grades five and six back, okay? Um, yeah, full time, you know? And then the, uh, uh, again, face-to-face -face on Friday, full time would still be there. And then eventually we would get to seven through 12. So, um, and the reason for the Friday is because of transportation, but just way too clumsy to be able to do it any other way. Um, 
So out, outside of that, I mean, that's what it would look like to come back face to face. The protocols and the safety measures would be in place like now, like they, they would still be there. I also want people to know if we bring kids back, there's no way that we will guarantee that you can be more than six feet away. It's not possible. So I think it's important everybody understand it. And early on, and the guidelines say to the greatest extent possible, but the size of our classrooms, we just can't fit everybody six feet away. For example, in our elementary classrooms, on average, we can fit about 18 students in a classroom, maybe 19 in a, in a room or two that still can be six feet away. And so it could still be possible in some classrooms, but once we get you know, some of our other classes and in, in third and fourth grade, we've got some, you know, 24 kids in a class, 25, six feet away is not possible. Uh, so I want everybody, I want you all to know that, that, that we bring, when we make the decision to bring kids back, we, we cannot do it at six feet. We'll do it to the greatest extent possible. We'll have other mitigation strategies in play. Um, but that's the reality of our building sizes, classroom sizes. The other question that um, I just earlier in the meeting that yeah, you had said that it may come down as a mandate that students may not have masks breaks during the day anymore. And if they can't have a mask break in seven hours, then I would not be comfortable keeping with the hybrid plan. It's just too long without them. I can't do it. So the only time, based on what was issued yesterday, is when they eat lunch, get a drink. They obviously you you can't do that without having you know with having your mask on. So they would technically get a break when they would eat, get a drink. But we're trying to get clarification if we're still permitted to allow mask breaks, and we don't have an answer to that yet. So if a kid doesn't bring a water bottle because they're not thirsty, then they just don't get a mask break, other than if they're eating based on the guidance issued yesterday yes and we're just trying to get clarification so that, that's what i mean i don't in the past they've been very specific about mass breaks they did not issue that yesterday so we're trying to get more granular information and i just don't i just don't have the answer to that if we're allowed to provide a mass break i mean in other situations when stuff has come out it's usually taken them a couple of days to provide clarification for schools so right but if that happens if if it takes a few days to get that clarification then it's how long until our next board meeting and students are sitting in the classroom with zero mask breaks what do we do about that so i, I think we talked about this at the last board meeting that we can spin up a board meeting with the minimum amount of time to for public notice but for is it 48 hours I mean, in, in certain, certain situations, we could do it within 24 hours, but we'll do everything we can with as much advance notice as possible. And I, I just, I wanna go back to this statement. Short-term closures have been related to COVID cases. If you were to go remote, I would want it to be for a longer period of time because you're changing the actual health and safety plan. So there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a difference in my mind and if you make a change to the plan to change it back, takes that official board action. So I just don't want you guys, I don't want everybody to lose sight of that. So just my understanding that this is on the agenda as a discussion item. So um, just for the sake, Amanda, I know you're brand new a little bit. Um, so if we were going to change what we were doing, then someone would have to make a motion for what they wanted to change. And then the board would have to vote. We'd have to, we have to make a motion, get a second, open up for discussion, close, vote, like your typical. And Shane, I would like to ask that um, as soon as you would get that mask mandate information. I, I would ask for a board email within a couple hours and that we would schedule a meeting. I, I, I'll do my best, depends on when I get it. Okay. 
just to be. You know, if you get if it get Saturday it at, night, if you I get it at ten at night, uh, guys, I mean, I'm just, I want to be, just want to be real. I'll do my best to get it to you as quickly as possible. I have an editing suggestion, um, just from because when you handed me this, I looked at it. I'm like, there is a wall of text, and I do not want to read this. <laughs> so um, I was wondering, can we break it up with head like bold headlines for each section, like um, starting with your second full paragraph as the board was concluding? Can that be something like initial discussion to go hybrid, and then the next paragraph have another break adjustments to the hybrid that's model that's for this? What I would suggest, but that kind of stuff, just make notes. Okay. And then at the end, we'll collect it. Okay. I'd make grammar notes. Okay. I wasn't sure how that. Yeah. By the worked. way, I will. I just wanted to say then too. I, I, I um. Thank you for writing this statement. So this statement is something that I think um, the parents have literally come and asked us for this type of communication. I think all of us have talked to a lot of parents that wanted to know that. I think the story Amanda told us earlier illustrated, I think the vast majority of the parents I've interacted with, luckily I haven't had a parent that just wanted to yell at me. Most of the parents, universally, almost every parent I talk to wants us to come full back, which I think is what most of us want, what all of our school district wants. But then once well, they hear- Ironically, no, I can tell oh, you- I'm sorry, I'm parents sorry, you're right, right, right. I, full back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would like us to go full back and a lot of the people I talk to do. But I think then once then they hear some of the ideas of you know why we're hybrid, what we've done, what the school district has accomplished, they're more agreeable to it then. So that's why I always thought having a statement and releasing a statement as a board was an important idea for us because it turns a lot of our enemies into friends or at least not enemies then too because a lot of the parents or people in the community then are unhappy with what's going and then they only ever hear silence from us when we had that moment of silence in our meeting two months ago or whatever that that sent a lot of shockwaves through our community and they think then that we weren't listening to them um but once they understand that we were and they hear a lot of this stuff which i think the statement shows they at least now are maybe not necessarily even on our side but they're no longer actively working against us so that's why i think putting out a statement like this is so important because then it turns a lot of those people and instead of spreading negativity now they're spreading more positivity so i think that's something they can do and i think then you list some of the criteria criteria might not be the right word but the idea of then what is our plan moving forward and that gives them the idea and one of the most important parts of our hybrid model then too is that we wanted to minimize the amount of disruptions that's something that we've talked about a lot so i know some of the data and some of the other problems that we see with the numbers of infections and or cases and that kind of stuff and too can push us in one direction but the idea is we still hopefully want to minimize all right i think one of the things that we want to do is to make sure that we minimize those disruptions to our students so it seems that we have a plan moving forward and we're going to let our parents and community know what that plan is and overall our idea is to minimize those disruptions and then when everything something needs to change we can have another meeting and make a different decision if we need to. But in the meantime, at least everyone knows, including the parents, what our plan is moving forward. Thank you. Any other comments? So to clarify for the people who are listening, we are- I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Project through your mask. <laughs> to clarify for the people who are listening, we are currently not recommending a change to our current instructional model or our health and safety plan. We are going to continue to do what we're doing in the hybrid format. Yes, that was not something we did planned on where we were going to talk about unless people want to but let's finish this portion first and then you know we have there's anything else we need to talk about we can okay okay if there's if there's edits that you want me to have just after the meeting's over you can pass your docs and, and over to me and i'll I'll get those incorporated in. Shane, I'll I'll merge them, uh, get them back to you for review, and then I'll get them edited, and then you can send them to Brooke. 
now um, we could probably talk about what's the best way to distribute this. I'm looking to you, Shane, from a distribution perspective. What do you, what's your thoughts? Well, I mean, from our standpoint, we have Sapphire that, that only goes out to um, our families, those that have the email. So we could definitely push, uh, push that out. Um, you could couch this as an official press release, and we can certainly get it to the Gettysburg Times, and you could issue a, a big press release and – um, I'm assuming that they would publish it to the paper, which would catch the greater community. Um, and then post it to the website. Post it to the website. Sure. Unless, Matt, you want to do a TikTok video or something. Opposed, I'm not opposed to that, but I'd really like to wait a couple of days until we find out about this mass. It's going, to it's going to take a couple of days to get this turned around. Okay. Because, because I don't want to send this out and then two days later mm -hmm. find out kids have to be wearing masks and then come in here and vote to go fully remote. Okay. Okay. I guess my only counter mic is a little bit though too. I, I think we have delayed issuing a statement for a while. So while I understand everything Jen just said, I don't want us to delay too long because we've already delayed getting a statement out for what I think too long. I understand. Okay. Is there anything else to be brought before the board? Like, what do you think is the timeline? Do you have an idea of how long to get the edits back until when we will? And then what's that process then to once you make the edits, will you send it out to us to review before? Or how does that process work? Yeah, we'll send, I'll send it out to, to everybody to review. By, so my, my goal will be to get to the, ed, the edits to Dr. Hotchkiss by Friday morning. And then he has about 30 minutes to get them back to me so that we can, no, um, just kidding. Uh, and then, imagine sometime at that point you'd be able to provide any feedback that we can then push it out to you sometime on friday i will get it edited and then it'll be to the solicitor uh no later than monday yes you should get them to me before yeah but before ashley probably sunday So I'm not going to have it edited twice because that per I don't want to tie up that person's time. So to clarify, what I hear you saying is you want it. Well, I don't know that I fully understand <laughs> how you want to communicate it once all of that goes through. So I, I think what we're going to do is Sapphire website, Gettysburg Times. And you know, Adam can have a conversation with you and or I to see how he would you know, how he would want to put that in there if they're willing to put it even to report on it. Right. And, and keep in mind, this is coming. It's written from the perspective of you as a board. Right. Okay, is there anything else to be brought before the board? Okay, call the meeting adjourned. Thank you.